critical reasoning strategies. Now for the structure, you would be provided with a short passage, also called the argument, and that passage will be followed by a specific question related to the passage with five answer choices. Let's look at an example directions. For this question type, select the best of the given answer choices, for example. Most theta students are happy students and most serious students go to graduate school. Furthermore, all students who go to graduate school are overworked. So the statements that have been provided in the stimulus can be followed by this diagram. So we have most serious students that are happy students. So these are most. And the next one, most serious students go to graduate school again most furthermore all students who go to graduate school are overworked so let us look at this with the help of an example using numbers so let's say there are 10 serious students and what will that mean that will mean that at least six of them are happy now, if most serious, serious students go to graduate school, then it must be true that at least one happy student goes to graduate school. Since all graduate school students are overworked, that means there must be at least one happy student who is also overworked. Right? That means what are we trying to say that some happy students are overworked. Let's go back to the options. We have, right, that will be option B. Some happy students are overworked. Let's look at the nitty gritty of this concept. So critical reasoning is largely composed of arguments and argument parts. And it basically checks skills of logical thinking and critical evaluation. Hence, one needs an eye for detail. There would be about 13 to 14 questions interposed throughout the verbal section and it's the possibility that the best tool is to check the managerial aptitude. So let us look at what these argument parts are. Now argument or the passage generally consists of facts and conclusions. Now what facts do, what, uh, facts do they support the conclusion? They are also called assertion, evidence, premise, proof, supposition etc these are the facts that support the conclusion and conclusion is what the author tries to establish using facts also known as all of these words judgment opinion suggestion view idea belief etc so what is the importance here to find the correct conclusion if you find the correct conclusion that means half the job is done and if we can identify the conclusion, everything else becomes a fact automatically. So let's find the conclusion in this one. In a study, infant monkeys given a choice between two surrogate mothers, a bare wire structure equipped with a milk bottle or a soft sweet covered wire structure equipped with a milk bottle, unhesitatingly choose the latter. When given a choice between a bare wire structure equipped with a milk bottle and a soft, sweet covered wire structure lacking a milk bottle, they unhesitatingly choose the former. So what is happening here? This one is a fact set. Everything that they have provided are facts. Hence, there is no conclusion. The next one. A free marketplace of ideas ensures that all ideas get a fair hearing. Even ideas tainted with prejudice and malice can prompt beneficial outcomes. In most countries, however, the government is responsible for over half the information released to the public through all media. For this reason, the power of governments over information needs to be curtailed. Everyone grants that governments should not suppress free expression. Yet governments continue to construct near monopolies on the publication and dissemination of enormous amount of information. 
So what is happening here? A free marketplace of idea ensures that all, all ideas get fair hearing. And even ideas tainted with prejudice and malice can prompt beneficial outcomes. So if you keep reading this part, it says, for this reason, the, gov the power of governments over information needs to be curtailed. Now, this part of the paragraph or the argument is the conclusion. That's the conclusion for us to have to find. The next one. Last month, OCFINC announced what it described as a unique new product, an adjustable computer workstation. Three days later, Ergotech unveiled an almost identical product. The two companies claim that the similarities are coincidental and occurred because the designers independently reached the same solution to the same problem. The similarities are too fundamental to be mere coincidence. However, the two products not only look alike, but they also work alike. Both are oddly shared with identically placed control panels with the same type of controls. Both allow the same types of adjustments and the same types of optional enhancement. So if you look at the paragraph, the particular statement, the similarities are too fundamental to be mere coincidence, however, or till coincidence. This part of the paragraph is the conclusion for the passage. The next one. It is well known that many species adapt to their environment, but it is usually assumed that only the most highly evolved species alter their environment in ways that aid their own survival. However, this characteristic is actually quite common. Certain species of plankton, for example, generate a gas that is converted in the atmosphere into particles, into particles of sulfate. These particles cause water vapor to condense, thus forming clouds. Indeed, the formation of clouds over the ocean largely depends upon the presence of these particles. More cloud cover means more sunlight is reflected and so the earth absorbs less heat. Thus, plankton cause, causes the surface of the earth to be cooler and this benefits the plankton. So if you look at the paragraph and when you say that certain species of plankton, for example, generate a gas that is converted in the atmosphere into particles of sulfate. Now, this is a fact. Again, when you say certain species, I mean, when you continue reading, I'm sorry, these particles cause water vapor to condense, thus forming clouds. Again, fact. Indeed, the formation of clouds over the ocean largely depends upon the presence of the article of these particles. Fact. More cloud cover means more sunlight is reflected and so the earth absorbs less heat. Fact. Thus, plankton causes the surface of the earth to be cooler and this benefits the plankton is the sub-conclusion. And which is the main conclusion? The main conclusion is that this characteristic is actually quite common. That's the main conclusion. And if you look at it, we've also found a conclusion. Hence, there are two conclusions for this argument. One is the main conclusion that this characteristic, characteristic is actually quite common and that this particular, because of this particular reason, plankton causes the surface of the earth to be cooler and hence benefits the plankton. Is the sub-conclusion, which in turn illustrates the main conclusion. Rain-soaked soil contains less oxygen than does drier soil. The roots of melon plants perform less efficiently under the low oxygen conditions present in rain-soaked soil. When the efficiency of melon roots is impaired, the roots do not supply sufficient amounts of the proper nutrients for the plants to perform photosynthesis at their usual levels. It follows that melon plants have a lower than usual rate of 
photosynthesis when their roots are in rain-soaked soil. When the photosynthesis of the plant slows, sugar stored in the fruits is drawn off to supply the plants with energy. Therefore, ripe melons harvested after a prolonged period of heavy rain should be less sweet than other ripe melons. In the argument given, the two portions in bold face play which of the following roles? Okay. And before we get to the options, so the very first statement, rain-soaked soil contains less oxygen than does drier soil. That's a fact. The roots, this first bold statement, until rain-soaked soil, again, fact. When the efficiency of melon, fact. But when you say it follows that melon plant, right? It's a double line. That means it's a sub-conclusion. It follows that melon plants have a lower than usual rate of photosynthesis when their roots are in rain-soaked soil. So that's your sub-conclusion. Again, the statement, when the photosynthesis of the plants, that's your fact. And again, when you say, therefore, ripe melons, that is your main conclusion. So here, there are two conclusions, right? So one's the main conclusion, and this statement is your sub-conclusion. So let's look at the options. The first one says, the first states the conclusion of the argument as a whole, the second provides support for that conclusion. It is the wrong one. Why? Because the conclusion is the last statement, but not the first one. So among the two, the second one is the conclusion, right? So hence, first one is the wrong. The first provides support for the conclusion of the argument as a whole. The second provides evidence that supports an object to, the, to that conclusion. Again, this one's wrong. Why? Because they are using the word objection and it makes the entire thing wrong. Option C. The first provides support for an intermediate conclusion that supports a further conclusion stated in the argument. The second states the intermediate conclusion. This is the correct one. Why? Because we have two statements here. Right? One's the main conclusion this one and the first statement is your sub-conclusion. Option D. The first serves as an intermediate con conclusion that supports a further conclusion stated in the argument. The second states that the position that the argument as a whole opposes. Again, they've used the word opposes, but the second one does not oppose, right? Hence, it's strong. Third, I mean, I'm sorry, the last, the first states the position that the argument as a whole opposes. The second supports the conclusion of the argument. Again, opposes. Hence, the third one. The first provides support for an intermediate conclusion. Why? Because that is your sub-conclusion. And that supports a further conclusion stated in the argument. And the second, it states the intermediate conclusion. Let's look at the type of questions you have in the segment of critical reasoning. So you have conclusion and inference type of questions, assumptions, weaken, strengthen, evaluate, paradox, boldface, and miscellaneous type of questions. And let's look at each of them. So the first one, the conclusion or the inference type of question. So the questions can state the following are usually, I'm sorry, they are usually stated in the following manner. So you will say, which of the following conclusions, assertions, inference, or statements is more strongly supported by the passage? Which of the following must be true as per the passage? Which of the following can be inferred? The author is arguing that the main point of the passage is that which of the following can complete the passage? Which of the following is an example of the given passage? So you can have... Your questions stated in any of these manners, especially for the type 1. That is the conclusion or inference type of pattern. So how do you solve conclusion-based questions? By word matching and by 
translation. These both are your most important skills. Now, any statement that is inconsistent with the passage is always wrong. Always remember that. Hence, the correct answer must be true. Not may not be true. You have to be sure. And as always, elimination is the best strategy. So let's do an example for this pattern. It says choose the correct conclusion or conclusions. Any number of answers may be right. So the question is the minimum voting age for males in district X is 18 years. So the first option says every male above 18 can vote in district X. So this one is wrong. Why? Because there are other conditions, nationality, citizenship, crime record, etc. Hence, you cannot, this cannot be the conclusion. Someone who is not 18 cannot vote in District X. So this question says or is talking about males while the option or the choice uses someone. That means it's trying to generalize. It could be anybody. Hence, second is also not the conclusion. A male who is not 18 can not vote in District X. So what is this option stating? This option is stating that when it says not 18, that means this person can be above 18 or below 18. Hence, no, that's not the conclusion. For a male to be eligible to vote in District X, he must be 18 years old. It says he... For a male to be eligible to vote, he must be 18 years old. That means what? If What if he is above 18? Right? He, this one is only implying that only 18 years can vote. But even people above 18 or men above 18 can vote. Right? Hence, wrong. The last one. For a male to be eligible to vote in District X, he must be at least 18 years old. It says at least. Hence, this is the Right translation, that is the conclusion. So let's do an example for this pattern. It says choose the correct conclusion or conclusions. Any number of answers may be right. So the question is, the minimum voting age for males in district X is 18 years. So the first option says, every male above 18 can vote in district X. So this one is wrong. Why? Because there are other conditions, nationality, citizenship, crime record, etc. Hence, you cannot, this cannot be the conclusion. Someone who is not 18 cannot vote in District X. So this question says or is talking about males while the option or the choice uses someone. That means it's trying to generalize. It could be anybody. Hence, second is also not the conclusion. A male who is not 18 can not vote in District X. So what is this option stating? This option is stating that when it says not 18, that means this person can be above 18 or below 18. Hence, no, that's not the conclusion. For a male to be eligible to vote in District X, he must be 18 years old. It says he... For a male to be eligible to vote, he must be 18 years old. That means what? If what if he is above 18? Right? He, this one is only implying that only 18 years can vote. But even people above 18 or men above 18 can vote. Right? Hence, wrong. The last one. For a male to be eligible to vote in District X, he must be at least 18 years old. It says at least. Hence, this is the... Right translation, that is the conclusion. Understanding conditionals, if then. So always remember, if X relates to Y, and for you to find out the conclusion, it will always be the other way around. That means the Y naught will lead to X naught. This has to be the conclusion, but not the other two. If X relates to Y, the conclusion cannot be that y relates to x, nor can the conclusion be that x naught relates to y naught. No, it will always be that y naught relates to x naught. Let's look at an example. So the statement says, if one plays in the rain, one gets cold. So according to the condition that we've just understood, which of these options is the correct choice? 
it will be statement 3. Why? X is your ray, cold is your Y. So Y naught means hasn't got cold. You have your Y naught first relates to one hasn't played in the rain. This is your X naught. Hence, option 3 is the right one. So this is understanding conditional. Always if X relates to Y, then Y naught will lead to X naught. Mystery stories often feature a brilliant detective and the detective's dull companion. Clues are presented in the story and the companion wrongly infers an inaccurate solution to the mystery using the same clues that the detective uses to deduce the correct solution. Thus, the author's strategy of including the dull companion gives readers a chance to solve the mystery while also diverting them from the correct solution. Which of the following conclusions can be correctly drawn from the passage above? Most mystery stories feature a brilliant detective who solves the mystery presented in the, in the story. Now here, if you go back to the paragraph, it says mystery stories often feature a brilliant detective. The word often is used and what does often mean? It means frequently. But frequently is not same as the word most. And the first option has the word most in it. Right? Had the stimulus used more often than not, that would mean most would be the correct answer. Or the or the usage of most would be appropriate. Hence, option A is wrong. Option B, mystery readers often solve the mystery in a story simply by spotting the mistakes in the reasoning of the detective's dull companion in that story. Now, we cannot determine if readers of mystery stories solve the mystery simply by spotting the errors of the dull companion. Hence, no. Option C, some mystery stories give readers enough clues to infer the correct solution to the mystery. Now, this, if you go back to uh, the paragraph, it says clues are present in the story and the companion wrongly infers an inaccurate solution to the mystery using the same clues that the detective uses to deduce the correct solution. Now, if you combine this with the last statement that the author's strategy of including so on and so forth, right? This answer is this answer is proven by facts. Hence, this option. Some mystery stories give readers enough clues to infer the correct solution to, to solve the mystery or correct solutions to the mystery is the correct one. Why? Because if you look at this statement, the very last statement the author strategy, so on and so forth. That's the conclusion. And this conclusion is the primary evidence that is also being supported by option C. How about option D? It says the actions of the brilliant detective in the mystery story rarely divert readers from the actions of the detective's dull companion. Now, if you look for the facts in the stimulus, does this support the answer? No. But although the dull companion diverts readers from the correct solution is mentioned, we do not know if actions of the brilliant detective rarely divert readers from the actions of the dull companion. Right? Hence, not even option D. Option E. The detective's dull companion in the mystery story generally uncovers the misleading clues that diverts readers from the mystery's correct solution. Now, option E, what does it state? It states that the dull companion uncovers misleading clues. Now, this is incorrect because the interpretation of the clues is misleading, not the clues themselves. Option C is the one that can be correct, correctly drawn from the passage above. Let us look at some modifier words. All 100, when it says some 1 to 99, also mean or even 100. Most means 51 to 99 or even 100. Not all, none, 
Often many much means not defined. The next one. The Newtonian, uh, I'm sorry, Newtonian physics dominated science for over two centuries. It found consistently successful application becoming one of the most highly substantiated and accepted theories in the history of science. Nevertheless, Einstein's theories came to show the fundamental limits of Newtonian physics and to surpass the Newtonian view in the early 1900s, giving rise once again to a physics that has so far enjoyed wide success. Which one of the following logically follows from the statement above? Option A. The history of physics is characterized by a pattern of one successful theory, subsequently surpassed by another. Now the two theories cited in the stimulus are not sufficient to form a pattern, which is the basis of the answer choice, right? So hence no. Option B, long-standing success or substantiation of theory of physics is no guarantee that the theory will continue to be dominant in, indefinitely. Now, as shown by the case of Newtonian physics, success and substantiation is no guarantee of dominance. Hence, this is the correct choice. Option C. Every theory of physics, no matter how successful, is eventually surpassed by one that is more successful. Now, this is an exaggerated answer that takes one instance and exaggerates it into a pattern. Now, although Newtonian physics was surpassed, this does not prove that every theory of physics will be eventually surpassed. Hence, the answer goes farther than the facts of the stimulus and fails the fact test. Option D. Once a theory of physics is accepted, it will remain dominant for centuries. Again, this option goes too far. Although some theories of physics have been dominant for centuries, there is no guarantee that every theory will be dominant for that long. Option E. If a long accepted theory of physics is surpassed, it must be surpassed by a theory that is equally successful. Now, even though Einsteinian physics has enjoyed wide success in surpassing Newtonian physics, nowhere in the stimulus is there evidence to prove that each theory must be surpassed by an equally successful theory. Hence, option B. People with serious financial problems are so worried about money that they cannot be happy. Their misery makes everyone close to them, family, friends and colleagues and happy as well. Only if their financial problems are solved can they and those around them be happy. Which one of the following statements can be properly inferred from the passage? So this is the if x then y uh, pattern. So here what should it be if a leads to b what will that mean? That means B not A not. Right? Now if you go back to the options and among these, what will it be? It will be if people are happy, they do not have serious financial problem. Why? Because it says people with serious financial prob problems are worried about money. Right? And they cannot be happy. So that means what? Serious financial problems are not happy. What That means what should we have? Happy, not seriously financial uh, problems. So that is happening only in option E. The head baker at Barry Bagels can either purchase flour in person from the local flour mill, Larry's local mill, or order a shipment of flour from an out-of-state mill, Isidore's interstate mill. The cost of the flour from Isidore's interstate mill is 10% less than the cost of the flour from Larry's local mill. Even after shipping and handling fees are added, it's still cheaper to order flour 
that has to be shipped from Isadores than to buy flour locally from Larry's. The statements above, if true, best support which of the following assertion. Look at the first option. All right, so the cost of the flour from the local mill is higher than the cost of the flour from the out-of-state mill. However, when purchasing from the out-of-state mill, Barry's Bagels must pay shipping and handling fees that would not apply to a purchase from the local mill. Hence, purchasing the flour from the out-of-state mill will only be cheaper if those shipping and handling fees are smaller than the difference in the flour costs of the two suppliers. Also, again, we cannot assume any additional information or more beyond the scope of the given premises in order to find the conclusion. So let us look at the options. The first one says production costs at Isadore's interstate mill are 10% lower than those at Larry's local mill. So the lower production costs could explain the lower price of the flour from Isadore's interstate mill, but there may be a variety of other reasons. Hence, we cannot state this conclusively. Buying flour from Isadore's interstate mill will eliminate 10% of the local flour mill jobs. It is possible that the number of local flour mill jobs would be decreased, but no evidence in the passage leads to that conclusion. Option C. The shipping and handling fees for a batch of flour purchased from Isidore's Interstate Mill are less than 10% of the cost of an identical batch of flour purchased from Larry's local mill. Now, this statement is properly identifying the point that for ordering from an out-of-state mill to be less expensive, the shipping and handling fees must be less than the difference in the flour costs of the two suppliers. Right. Let's say, for example, there is a batch of flour that costs $100 from Larry's local mill. What will the passage tell us? That the same batch would cost $90 from Isidore's in interstate mill. Yet, when purchasing from Isidore's, handling and shipping fees would apply. And what are we told? We are told that Isidore's total cost is sh cheaper than Larry's. So mathematically, that will be about a $90 plus shipping and handling. It will be lesser than $100, which will mean that shipping and handling would be less than $10. That is 10% of the cost of flour from Larry's. Hence, option C would be the correct one. Option D, the shipping and handling fees for a batch of flour purchased from Isadore's interstate mill are more than 10% of the cost of Isadore's flour. Now, if shipping and handling fees were more than 10%, purchasing from the out-of-state supply would be more expensive but will not be less. Hence, D will also not work out. Option E, Isadore's interstate mill produces flour 10% more efficiently than Larry's local mill does. Now, higher efficiency could explain the lower price of the flour from Isidore's interstate mill, but there may be a variety of other reasons. Hence, again, this option, we cannot state this conclusively. Last January, in an attempt to lower the number of traffic fatalities, the state legislature passed its click it or ticket law. Under the new law, motorists can be pulled over and ticketed for not wearing their seat belts, even if an additional driver driving infraction has not been committed. Lawyers and citizens groups are already protesting the law, saying it's unfair saying it unfairly infringes on the rights of the state's drivers. Law enforcement groups counter these claims by stating that the new regulations will save countless additional lives. Which of the following inferences is best supported by the passage above? Now, what does the argument explain? The argument explains that the new click it or ticket law is generating controversy. And under the new law, drivers can be cited for not wearing their 
സീറ്റ് ബെൽസ് ഈവൻ ഇൻ ദി ആബ്സെൻസ് ഓഫ് എൻ അഡിഷണൽ ഡ്രൈവിംഗ് ഇൻഫ്രാക്ഷൻ എനി ആക്സെപ്റ്റബിൾ ഇൻഫ്ലുൻസ് മസ്റ്റ് ബി ഡയറക്ട്ലി സപ്പോർട്ടഡ് ബൈ ദി എവിഡൻസ് ഫ്രോം ദ ടെക്സ്റ്റ് റൈറ്റ് സോ അക്കോർഡിംഗ് ടു ദി ഓപ്ഷൻസ് ദ ഫസ്റ്റ് വൺ സെസ് Prior to the click it or ticket law, motorists could not be stopped simply for not wearing a seat belt. Now the entire controversy is based on the new law that allows motorists to be cited, even in the absence of additional infraction. Hence it follows that prior to the passage of this law, an additional driving infraction must have been necessary in order to stop and cite an individual for not wearing a seat belt. Hence, option A is the correct one. Option B. The click it or ticket law violates current search and seizure laws. Now, search and seizure laws are never mentioned in the text. Hence, this choice is out of scope for the, of the argument. Laws similar to click it or ticket have effectively reduced the traffic fatalities in a number of states now laws in other states are never mentioned in the text hence again this choice is also outside the scope of the argument the previous seat belt laws were ineffective in saving lives now though the text states that the new regulation might save countless additional lives the effectiveness of the previous laws are never mentioned here hence again no law enforcement groups rather than citizens groups should determine how to best ensure the safety of motorists now no preference is stated between law enforcement groups and the citizens groups this answer or this option is simply an opinion that is unsubstantiated by the text hence option a is the inference that best supports the above passage Meteorite explosions in the earth's atmosphere are large as the one that destroyed forests in Siberia with approximately the force of a 12 megaton nuclear blast occur about once a century the response of highly automated systems controlled by complex computer programs to unexpected circumstances is unpredictable now if the design I'm sorry now if the defense system designers did not plan for the contingency of large meteorite explosions such explosions would from the system's perspective be unexpected right they're asking which of the following conclusions can most properly be drawn if the statements above are true about a highly automated nuclear missile defense system controlled by a complex computer program within a century after its construction the system would react inappropriately and might accidentally start a nuclear war now this cannot be inferred why because it is consistent with the stated information that new that no meteorite explosion will occur within a century option b the system would be destroyed if an explosion of a large meteorite occurred in the earth's atmosphere now again this option cannot be inferred since there is no information to suggest that meteorite explosions in the atmosphere would destroy the system option c it would be impossible for the system to distinguish the explosion of a large meteorite from the explosion of a nuclear weapon again option c also cannot be inferred since it is consistent with the stated information that an appropriately designed nuclear defense system might be able to distinguish nuclear from meteorite explosions option d whether the system would respond inappropriately to the explosion of a large meteorite would depend on the location of the blast again there is no information to suggest that the location of blasts would determine the appropriateness of defense systems response hence d also cannot be infer option e it is not certain what the system's response to the explosion of a large meteorite would be if its designers did not plan for such a contingency now if the desi- uh, if the defense system designers did not plan for the contingency of large meteorite explosions 
then such explosions would, from the system's perspective, be unexpected. And the system's response to such explosions is, consequently, unpredictable. Hence, option E expresses thus that inference and hence it's the right answer. Type 2 in critical reasoning, the bold-faced questions. Now, how is the structure? The structure is usually, uh, it's usually a long paragraph wherein you have two statements or statement parts that are written in bold. One has to choose the option that tells the function or the role played by these bold parts. It involves argument structure concepts and one should be able to tell which is a fact a conclusion and how the argument is structured. One must know all the terms that are commonly used for fact and conclusion. So what are the words used? Facts to sub that support the conclusion are also called assertion, evidence, premise, proof, supposition, data, information, research, etc. Now conclusion is what the author tries to establish using those facts also known as judgment, opinion, view, suggestion, idea, belief, proposal, warning, etc. Sometimes the argument may contain two conclusions. The statement that can be used to prove the main conclusion is usually the sub-conclusion. In such a situation, the one-line crisp message of the argument is the main conclusion and the other is the sub-conclusion. So when you ask yourself about the author's position, that will help you get the main conclusion. Sometimes these two conclusions may be contradictory to each other. When is that possible? Especially when you have two sides that are involved, both the author and the critics, etc. Steps to solve bold-faced questions. You have to identify the conclusion or more if there are any conclusions and always do not jump to choices. Map the argument and have that flow in mind. Understand which of them are facts and which of them form the conclusions, either the sub-conclusion or the main conclusion. Again, understand which statement supports the conclusion and which supports the alternative conclusion. Go to the choices and then eliminate. Astronomer. Observations of the shoemaker Levi comet on its collision course with Jupiter showed that the comet broke into fragments before entering Jupiter's atmosphere in 1994, but they did not show how big those fragments were. Nevertheless, some indication of their size can be inferred from spectrographic analysis of Jupiter's outer atmosphere. After the fragments entry, these analyses revealed unprecedented traces of sulfur. The fragments themselves almost certainly contain no sulfur, but astronomers believe that the cloud layer below Jupiter's outer atmosphere does contain sulfur. Now, since sulfur would have seeped into the outer atmosphere if comet fra fragments had penetrated this cloud layer, it is likely that some of the fragments were at least large enough to have passed through Jupiter's outer atmosphere without being burnt up. In the astronomer's arguments, the two portions in bold face play which of the following roles? Now, what can be said from this paragraph that it is likely that some of the fragments were at least large enough to have passed through Jupiter's outer atmosphere without being burn, burned up. And that can give an indication of the size of the fragments. Now looking at these two bold statements, the first one says, after the fragments entry, these analysis revealed unprecedented traces of sulfur. Now what does this particular bold statement say? That it can be a consideration that the author is trying to prove something, right? And what does the second statement say? It says, sulfur would have seeped into the outer atmosphere if comet fragments had penetrated this cloudy layer, cloud layer. And the second bold statement is definitely not a conclusion. So let us look at the options. 
The first is a claim that the astronomer seeks to show is true. The second acknowledges a consideration that weighs against the truth of that claim. The first is a claim that the astronomer seeks to show is true. The second provides evidence in support of the truth of the claim. The first and the second are each considerations advanced in support of the conclusion of the argument. The first provides evidence in support of the conclusion of the argument. The second is that conclusion. The first is a circumstance for which the astronomer seeks to provide an explanation. The second acknowledges a consideration that weighs against the explanation provided by the astronomer. Now, according to the passage, the conclusion or uh, what the advocate argues for is eliminating the state requirement that legal advertisements must specify fees for specific services would almost certainly increase rather than further reduce consumers' legal costs. Costs. Now, what follows the statement is preceded by the two concessions that the advocate admits and also that tends to the point in the opposite direction. And now, again, what follows the statement of the position are the reasons that the advocate has for holding that position. So let us look at options. The first option, the first is a generalization that the consumer advocate accepts as true. The second is presented as a consequence that follows from the truth of that generalization. Now, the first part is true, but the second is not, according to option A. Option B, the first is a pattern of cause and effect that the consumer advocate argues will be repeated in the case at issue. The second acknowledges a circumstance in which that pattern would not hold. Now, although the first boldface portion, it presents a pattern of cause and effect, the advocate's prediction is that in this case, right, that pattern will not hold. Hence, the role of the first bold face is incorrectly described. Option C. The first is a part of cause and effect that the consumer advocate predicts will not hold in the cause at issue. The second offers a consideration in support of that prediction. The first bold face portion, it does present a pattern of, I'm sorry, cause and effect. And the advocate's prediction is that his time, I'm sorry, this time that the pattern will be different. Also, the second bold phase for portion is one of the considerations that the advocate uses in support of that prediction. Right. Hence, option C is the right one. Option D. The first is evidence that the consumer advocate offers in support of the certain predictions. The second is that prediction. Here the advocate does not use the first bold face portion in support of any prediction. And instead he concedes that it runs counter to the advocate's own prediction. Option E. The first acknowledges the consideration that weighs against the main position that the consumer advocate defends. The second is that position. Now, while the role of the first bold face portion is correctly described here in option E, the second one has not been. Why? Because the position of the advocate is, the position uh, that the advocate is defending is not the second part of the bold face portion, right? But rather, the position has been identified above. Hence, option C is the right one. Traditionally, video game manufacturers have been most strongly influenced by serious video gamers because devoted gamers have historically purchased the majority of video games. Companies react to the desires of this market segment. Normally, devoted gamers crave speed and action. Thus, most manufacturers continue to produce games with faster chips and flashier graphics. Unfortunately, faster chips and flashier graphics are no longer in the industry's best interest. The devoted gaming market is deeply stagnant and it won't soon expand. 
To infuse new life into the video game market, manufacturers must simplify the functionality of their games. By doing so, current non-gamers will be attracted to join the ranks of video game fans. In the argument, the two portions in boldface play which of the following roles. What does the author explain here? The author explains that devoted gamers traditionally dictate the design of video games. But however, because of changes in the market, what does the author argue? The author argues that this system is no longer in the best interest of the industry. Instead, to infuse new life into the video game market, manufacturers should simplify their games in order to attract non-gamers into the gaming folds. Let's look at the options. The first one says, the first is a situation that the author believes to be true. The second offers evidence to explain this situation. Now, the first bold portion does relate a situation that the author believes to be true. However, the second bold face portion does not explain the situation. Instead, it offers evidence to demonstrate why this situation should not continue. Hence, the first one is incorrect. The second option. The first is a situation the author argues should not continue. The second provides evidence that the that supports the author's position. Absolutely correct. Why? Because the first bold face portion is a situation that the author believes to be true. And because of change in the markets, what does the author believe that the situation should not continue? And what is the second bold face portion uh, providing as an evidence? It supports the author's contention that the best way to grow the gaming market is to attract new gamers. Hence, option B is the right one. Option C. The first is a statement of fact that contradicts the author's position. The second is the author's position. Now, the first bold portion is a statement of fact that contradicts the author's position. However, the second bold face portion provides evidence to support author's position, but not the position itself. Option D, the first is a statement of fact that supports author's position. Second, a consideration that weighs against the author's position. Now, the first is a statement of fact, right? And that contradicts the author's position. And the second, it provides evidence to support the author's position. Last one. The first is a prediction that the author believes should not hold in this case. The second is an assumption that weighs against the author's position. What have we learned? We've learned that the first one is not a prediction. Rather, it is a statement of fact that the author believes should not hold in this case. And the second also is not an assumption. Also, it does not weigh against the author's position. Instead, it's a premise that provides evidence in support of the author's position. Type 3, assumption questions. So your assumptions are all unstated facts and hence they must be true if the conclusion is true. So what will be the formula when you have facts associated with assumptions? It will turn to be a conclusion. So what will your steps be? You have to ID the conclusion, make sure every other statement becomes a fact. Then try to place answer choices between the facts and the conclusion. And the choice that makes a flowing sound convincing argument will become your assumption. Let us learn how to. Let's look at the assumptions as gap fills for an example. So the first one says, Amy is less than 5 feet 6 inches tall. Therefore, she cannot be a successful model. So what is the assumption by the gap fill mo mode here for the model? That successful models must be 5, 6 or taller. So that is the assumption. Every male above 18 is allowed to vote in city X. Therefore, Jack must be allowed to vote in city X. So what can we concluded or what is the assumption that Jack is male and also that he is above 18. 
company owner to manager give this man this job he remain he will remain jobless otherwise what was the assumption that this man will not be able to get any other job company x doesn't pay very high salaries to inexperienced people therefore john's salary should be lowered what is that implying the assumption is that john is in experienced now what are the words that assumption questions will use words like assumption assumed assumes presupposition presupposed presupposes justify the conclusion inserted as an additional premise the conclusion cannot be true unless which of the following is true and lastly the conclusion will be more properly drawn if let us look at a few smart tips now something that is not mentioned in the facts but mentioned in the conclusion has to be mentioned in the assumption also look for a connection between the two elements right and that should occur in the assumption something that is mentioned both in the facts as well as in the conclusion will usually not figure in the assumption another type the only or the best way is that if the conclusion says the only way or the best way to achieve x is y the following is a valid assumption if it says there is no other or no other way to achieve x than y now example girl power magazine published an article proclaiming that one can lose up to 20 pounds a month by eating only soup Kelly concludes that the only way for her to lose 40 pounds in 2 months is to eat only soup for 2 months. What is happening here Kelly is un unable to lose 40 pounds of weight in 2 months in any other way that's the assumption. Right in any other way she has not been able to lose 40 pounds of weight in 2 months. Let's look at the third type of cause and effect. Now, if the conclusion of the argument is A causes B, then the following are some valid assumptions on G mat. What does that imply? That B does not cause A, and C does not cause B. Let's look at an example. Researchers in the field have noticed. that older antelope are more cautious therefore they have conducted that the quality of caution increases with age in antelope so according to the previous analysis a causes b here that is that means age results in caution so as per the first possible answer what can the assumption be according to b does not cause a that means increased caution does not enable antelope to live longer but when you are trying to consider c does not cause b what do we have to do we have to assume that there is nothing else that caused more caution in older antelope we can say here for example that all older or only older antelopes were injected with a caution increasing drug just a day prior to the research then the real reason will be the injection not old age right hence the assumption will be in this case that the injection was not responsible for the increased caution the fourth type of assumption negate and weaken so we can analogize an argument to a house let's compare it you know if you compare the facts are like the walls conclusion is like the roof and the assumptions form the foundation so as with the house foundation an assumption is a hidden part of the structure but critically to the integrity of the structure all the elements rest upon it so your facts and conclusions also rest upon the assumption so if the conclusion is valid that means the assumption has to be true and if the assumption is negated 
then the argument falls apart. So what will be the method? You have to first ID the conclusion, then logically negate the choices and always remember that the negated choice must undermine the conclusion. Let's look at an example. It says, his get rich quick scheme is simple. He will use a metal detector to find hidden treasures in the sand. Then he will sell the treasures to a local pawn broker. So there can be a lot of assumptions in this. What's the first assumption? That his metal detector is capable of detecting treasures hidden beneath the sand. The second one, that there are hidden treasures. That will be the second assumption. And the third one is that the local pawnbrokers will buy treasures from him. If we are able to negate any of these, then the argument will be weakened. Now, if something would have been justifiably regretted if it had occurred, then it is something that one should not have desired in the first place. Many foregone pleasures would have been justifiably regretted. It follows that many foregone pleasures should not have been desired in the first place. The conclusion above follows logically if which one of the following is assumed. Now, it says many foregone pleasures. Now, this is a new element that appears here in the conclusion. This is the conclusion. Let's look at options. One should never regret one's pleasure. Foregone pleasures that were not decided would not have been justifiably regretted. Everything that one desires and then regrets not having is a foregone pleasure. Many foregone pleasures would have been justifiably regretted. Nothing that one should not have desired in the first place fails to be a pleasure. So if you look at these options, options B, C and D, these three are the only ones that contain foregone pleasures. And option D says many. The, hence, if forced to make a very quick uh, decision, right, option D would be the best selection at this point of time, according to our analysis. And unfortunately, this technique is so powerful that this analysis does not always yield the correct answer. So, should not have been desired in the first place, should not have been desired in the first place, appears in both the premise as well as in the conclusion. Now, this element is not likely to appear in the correct choice. If you look at it, it does not say. Right? So, what will be the argument that many foregone pleasures should not have been desired in the very first place? And hence, it's the Hence, it is clear that there is a missing link here which is regretted, right? Hence, option D is the option that conveys this link very well and that is the answer. Psychiatrist, take any visceral emotion you care to consider. There are always situations in which it is healthy to try to express that emotion, Anger is a visceral emotion. So there are always situations in which it is healthy to try to express one's anger. The conclusion of the argument follows logically if which one of the following is assumed. So very quick mechanistic analysis here reveals that the correct answer should contain anger and visceral emotion. Right, these both. Now, if you look at the options, option B is the only one that says anger is a visceral emotion and it contains both these elements. Hence, the very same statement is the conclusion of the argument that anger is a visceral emotion. To prevent some conflicts of interest, Congress could prohibit high-level government officials from accepting positions as lobbyists for three years after such officials leave government service. One such official concluded, however, that such a prohibition would be unfortunate because it would prevent high-level government officials from 
earning a livelihood for three years. The official conclusion logically depends on which of the following assumption. So what does the official argue? The official argues that prohibiting high-level government officials from accepting positions as lobbyists for three years would prevent the officials from earning a livelihood for that period. And the reasoning tactically excludes the possibility of such officials earning a living through work other than lobbying. And if you look at the options, laws should not restrict the behavior of former government officials. Lobbyists are typically people who have previously been high-level government officials. Low-level government officials do not often become lobbyists when they leave government service. High-level government officials who leave government service are capable of earning a livelihood only as lobbyists. High-level government officials who leave government service are currently permitted to act as lobbyists for only three years. So what does the official argue here? The official argues that prohibiting high-level government officials from accepting positions as lobbyists for three years would prevent the officials from earning a livelihood for that period. And the reason tacitly excludes the possibility of such officials earning a living through work other than lobbying. Look at the options. Among these five options, option D is the one that expresses that tacit assumption. Right. Hence, this is the best answer or the best correct choice. If you look at option A, laws should not restrict the behavior of former government officials. Now, here the official's argument does not depend upon this assumption. And since the assumption would not be invalidated if some restrictions on the behavior of government officials were desirable. Option B, lobbyists are typically people who have been previously, who have previously been high level government officials. Now again, the official's argument does not depend upon this assumption. Why? Because the argument would not be invalidated if lobbyists were not typically former high level government officials. Option C, low-level government officials do not often become lobbyists when they leave government service. Again, the official's argument does not depend upon this assumption because the argument would not be invalidated if formal low-level government officials did not often become lobbyists. Option E, high-level government officials who leave government service are currently permitted to act as lobbyists for only three years. Now, again, the same thing. It does not depend upon this assumption because the argument would not be invalidated if formal high-level government officials could act as lobbyists indefinitely. Hence, it will be option D. High-level government officials who leave government service are, are capable of earning a livelihood only as lobbyists. When limitations were in effect on nuclear arms testing, people tended to save more of their money. But when nuclear arms testing increased, people tended to spend more of their money. The perceived threat of nuclear catastrophe, therefore, decreases the willingness of people to postpone consumption for the sake of saving money. The argument above assumes that. If you look at option C, it says, People's perception of the threat of nuclear catastrophe depends on the amount of nuclear arms testing being done. Now, on the basis of an observed correlation between arms testing and people's tendency to save money, what does the argument conclude? The argument concludes that there is a casual connection between a perception of threat and the tendency not to save. And that connection cannot be made unless... This one, unless option C, right, that point linking the 
perception of threat to the amount of test testing being done which has to be assumed to be true hence option c is the best answer look at options a and b the perceived threat of nuclear catastrophe has increased over the years most people supported the development of nuclear arms the conclusion does not depend on there having been an increase in the perceived threat over time or on how many people supported the development of nuclear arms hence both of these options cannot be assumed look at options d and e the people who saved the most money when nuclear arms testing was limited were the ones who supported such limitations there are more consumer goods available when nuclear arms testing increases now the argument does not deal with those who supported arms limitations or with the availability of consumer goods hence these both options are also not assumed if the airspace around centrally located airports were restricted to commercial airliners only those private planes equipped with radar most of the private plane traffic would be forced to use outlying airfields such a reduction in the amount of private plane traffic would reduce the risk of mid air collision around the centrally located airports the conclusion drawn in the first sentence depends on which of the following assumptions Download our revolutionary app for free AMC.